Well, first of all, of course, my great thanks to, to Dr. Andrew McRae for that uh, typically gracious introduction that he's uh, given, accentuating the, uh, the positive, as it were, and downplaying the negative in my uh, life, ministry, and, uh, and character. Um, it is a very great honor for me to be appointed the, the Simpson lecturer, and I was, as I was listening to the the roll call of those who have been my predecessors and who have uh, held this lectureship. I, I feel uh, humbled and I feel honored to, to be here. Secondly, if uh, a lecture like this uh, had been uh, slated for uh, a night like this in my homeland of Scotland, I don't think six people would have turned up for it. And so I'm, uh, I'm delighted to look out and see such a large audience on a snowy uh, evening. Um, I've followed the, uh, uh, the pattern of uh, the work of the Divinity College uh, here with great interest since I've come to Canada and uh, I've uh, admired uh, much of the creative work that has been done here and so it is a special pleasure for me to be in uh, Wolfville at this time not only to give these lectures, but to absorb and assimilate and listen to uh, much else that is happening uh, here uh, on the campus and in the Divinity College. Also, as, as Dr. McRae was saying, most of my uh, work and ministry uh, have been in, uh, in another land and in a somewhat different culture. Uh, and so because of that, I'm very aware that I'm not uh, just here to to talk to you, as it were. Um, I'm here to share and to listen and to learn. Uh, I'm not altogether Canadianized homiletically, um, apart from anything else, so this, you may help my process on um, as I share with you during this, uh, this week. Uh, the, the, the theme of the, of the uh, lectureship is uh, preaching and community, words in a context. And when I think about words in a context, I'm, I'm reminded of a, a story about a, a fellow Scot, a fellow Scottish preacher who was uh, traveling through the States on a preaching tour. And of course, he wanted to bring his best sermons with him. And he had one that was really his Royal George, as it were. And it was entitled, um, The Significant Butts of Scripture. Uh, he had a text like... Uh, you were without hope, but God, etc., uh, etc. Et the great buts of Scripture. And he was he was concentrating on the participle uh, but, but he did not realize that on this side of the world, the, the word but had another uh, connotation altogether, <laughs> as in get off your butt uh, kind of thing. So, uh, the more fervently he preached, the more hilariously his sermon was heard by the the congregation, his first point was that everyone has a butt. The <laughs> second point was that uh, some people have bigger butts than others. <laughs> and the third one was you can always see your neighbor's butt more easily than your own butt. So, uh, <laughs> so I shall try to avoid these uh, linguistic confusions uh, when I'm speaking about words in a context. I want to start with some w words from a great passage from the letter to the Hebrews. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all men, to the spirits of righteous men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. The writer says that's where he had come to. In his imagination, in his spirituality, that's where he was. But of course, there's a sense in which he wasn't there at all. We don't uh, altogether know. We need help from the New Testament scholars as to who the, uh, the author of the letter to the Hebrews is. But whoever he or she was, they were located in some place. They were sitting in some room. They wrote this letter in some town, somewhere around the Mediterranean basin. So this writer is describing the bifocal nature of Christian reality. Uh, 
You have come to Mount Zion. You have come to Jesus. You have come to the assembly of the firstborn. All of that. That's where he was. And yet, in another sense, he was not there at all. He was somewhere on earth in some town. And it seems to me that this bifocal reality sums up a great deal of the mystery of Christian preaching. Uh, the Christian preacher is someone who stands on some kind of boundary, some kind of borderland between earth and heaven, between time and eternity, between the uh, community of humankind and the, the rule of God. It's a little bit like Jacob at Bethel in the Old Testament uh, coming to this place called Luz, this place on earth called Luz, but transforming its name into Bethel, the house of God, where he had the dream and where he saw the angels ascending and descending. And a great deal of the, the mystery of Christian preaching uh, is summed up in that image of the preacher as the man or the woman, perhaps in a lonely way, standing on the borderline betwixt, betwixt time and eternity. What is the relationship between the community of humankind and the, uh, the basilia of God, the rule of God, the kingdom of God? Are they separate? Is there an interpenetration? Is it a matter of different ideological perception? And the further question is what the kingdom is in itself. It's important for preaching to address that question if preaching is to be at all in the theological continuity of Jesus himself who came into Galilee preaching the good news of the kingdom. So let's examine a little bit uh, both the nature of the community of humankind in which we stand and the community of the kingdom within which in, in our spirituality and in our uh, eschatological nature we stand. The word community is a very slippery word indeed, is it not? We speak about the community of nations. We speak about uh, the community of churches. We speak about a neighborhood with particular soci sociological characteristics as a community. There are all these ways of describing community. And I suppose that the word of our preaching will travel most typically into the public domain of our immediate community. The people who share with us a location in a particular city or a particular part of the city or a particular neighborhood. And for the purpose of earthing our theme into the community of humankind, let me look with you at two very different communities for they perhaps illustrate two, only two and almost at random, two of the kinds of communities into which the word of preaching uh, must reach in the marketplace of ideas. They are very different, but uh, some of us may work in places uh, quite like uh, one of them or quite like the other of them. I'm indebted to, uh, to a book by um, D.F. Wells for the profile of um, uh, a New England town called uh, Wenham, which perhaps illustrates one kind of community in which uh, some of us may uh, work and in which some of us may preach and have our churches. He speaks about Wenham as a product of the 19th century. He speaks about it religiously in the tradition of moderate congregationalism. Uh, the Congregational Chapel was for generations the largest and most central building in this town of uh, Wenham. And then it was in, in time displaced by the town hall, uh, inevitably, as, uh, as the uh, political development of the, uh, of the, of the town changed and uh, the social development of it uh, uh, came on apace, uh, displaced by the, the town hall. It was some miles north of Boston, but it, at that time, it was fairly insulated from the city. It had a settled lifestyle. All of that in the 19th century development of this town of Wenham. Can you think of towns uh, in and around uh, Nova Scotia, uh, all around Canada, that perhaps were towns a little, bit, a, bit, a little bit like that? But then, 
come right up to, to date and uh, superimpose modernity on this uh, traditional profile of this little town. And he says this, driving north from Boston today, one passes through mile after mile of urban sprawl, a sprawl that does not cease even at Wenham, but now surrounds and engulfs it. The development appears to have been entirely haphazard. The old and the new are mixed indiscriminately. Interspersed along the way are garish billboards, parking lots, commercial enterprises, factories belching foul fumes, slick modern architecture, churches. There is no longer a rural divide between Wenham and Boston as there was in the 19th century, an interlude of trees and fields between city and town life, nor are there any of the other interludes of a more psychological nature that stood between Wenham then and the modern world as it, as it was rapidly developing. As Wenham was absorbed into the greater Boston area, it was also absorbed into the modern world. Then Wenham stood aloof from the developments in Boston, demographically, industrially, and even theologically. But today, Wenhamites have become citizens in a larger society and within a larger world, the presence of which is inflicted on them 24 hours a day through television. Well, for Wenham, you could uh, insert any number of towns of that kind that once had an individuality of their own, a kind of physical insularity, geographical insularity of their own, but have now become suburbs, satellite towns of some megalopolis, some much larger, much larger city. And this might be the kind of community in which uh, many of us will minister. Um, communities which now have had superimposed upon their former stability uh, notions like impermanence and globalization and the rest. Now the shape of the community will determine, will it not, the expression of the word. And in this series of lectures I find myself, as I've been reflecting on it, coming back to the parable of the sower time and time again. The parable of the sower which seems to me to be as much about the soil and the nature of the soil as about the seed. And uh, where we sow the seed and how we sow the seed determines and is uh, related to the nature of the soil, the sociological soil in which the seed is sown. And this is something that I'm sure we always have got to be sensitive to in our uh, expression of the Christian word and in our practice of, uh, of preaching. Now, by contrast with Wenham, let me uh, take you to another and very different kind of, of human uh, community. Um, this is a community that I know from personal experience. Um, and I was in and out of this community, a ghetto community really, in the east end of Glasgow, uh, a very great deal for about five or six uh, years of my, my life. So let me take you to this ghetto in the east end of, uh, of Glasgow. Let me take you to, uh, to one of the most God-forsaken streets in, uh, that I've ever seen. Uh, let, uh, let us stroll along this uh, street and uh, try to absorb the sociology of, uh, of, a st of this street uh, as, a, as a kind of test bed for the theological meaning of the church's homiletical engagement with this kind of, this kind of street. Uh, let's call it uh, Stamford Street, because that, in fact, was its, uh, was its name. And let me sketch in one or two other features of the physical and the social environment for you. On a late November or December afternoon, as darkness is, is coming on and the rain is falling, uh, this street is a kind of urban tundra region. It has a bleakness that seems to seep into the very souls of the people. Uh, the entry doors at the front of the common entries are daubed, spray-painted, graffiti all up and down the stairs. And by this time of a November afternoon, let's say, the few professionals who have been working in the uh, ghetto have departed and have taken their cars with them. And the significant feature about the street from that time on during the evening is that you will not see a single automobile. In the, in the street. The life of the people is as static as if they were in a high security prison and the street is their world. 
Now all this then is an impressionistic tour of the sociology of Stamford Street. Its very imperfections make it philosophically seductive. Its uh, unattractiveness is its attraction. Marxists, either of a communist or a Christian persuasion, sometimes look at it and find it to be the incarnation of alienation. Christian Marxists see it as a product of crushing impersonal forces that are the modern re-mythologized equivalents of Paul's principalities and powers. And it's difficult to argue against the proposition that the heavy weight of structural bias bears down on this kind of community. And this bias is amply seen in all the relevant indices relating to unemployment and health and income and environment and education that spell out the social health or sickness of a community. To move from sociology to theology, there are a whole range of biblical images that come to my mind when I think of uh, Stamford Street. For example, in one way it is Egypt. It is, uh, it is also the wilderness. It is Egypt in the sense that the street is the locus of a resigned, dominated and repressed community. It is Egypt in the sense that if they are not slaves, they are not yet unfree in any meaningful sense of the word. Most of the possibilities for human expression uh, have to be eliminated from their existence because even if they could see them, they are disqualified from relate, relating to them. They are free to look into the shop window of human possibilities and potentialities, but not to buy anything from the shop. We haven't given them money. They have been asked to build bricks without straw. And the street is the wilderness in the sense that it is a place of uh, great featurelessness combined with terror beyond which is a promised land towards which there is hardly any movement at all from the street. But Stamford Street is also Nazareth. You remember what they said about Nazareth? Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Well, that's exactly what they say about Stamford Street. That is what employers say about it. That is what finance companies say about it. That is what insurance companies say about it. That is what some doctors and teachers and the retailers say about it. But moneylenders don't say that about, about uh, the street. And it's Babylon too, where they couldn't sing the Lord's song in an alien land. It wasn't that the Hebrews had suddenly become atheists through the experience of exile in Babylon. It was that their lives were clouded by an all-pervasive melancholy and sadness and that they were removed from the experience of the temple where they could see and behold the glory of God. And the people in the street are a bit like that. This wider environment of fulfillment is uh, denied them, but that denial has not turned them into atheists. Paradoxically, you won't find many atheists or agnostics in Stamford Street. But religion presupposes a sense of mystery, a psychological space within which one can feel emotions and penetrate to the experiences that are mysterious and spiritual and religious. It presupposes at least an intermittent perception of glory of the kind associated in the Old Testament with the temple in which Isaiah beheld the glory of God and of which Babylon was the obverse. And that is why the people in Stamford Street are believers. But they are believers unconnected with any ecclesiastical structure. They are believers in their own unformed way but with no experience to uh, fill it out. So that's Wenham, one kind of community. That's Stamford Street, a quite contrasting, deprived, ghetto kind of community. Let's just take these rough sketches of these communities. Let's take them and regard them as paradigmatic communities. Variations of them are spread all around the Western world. They are where we are called to be the servants of Jesus and the proclaimers of the kingdom. To analyze these communities a little further, let's look at the components 
which in their different ways are common to each of these communities and all other communities. There is a cultural component that is part of every community. Culture is made up of a symbiotic, in a, uh, interactive collection of ideas that prevail in any community and become the conceptual stock that finds its expression in the life of the community. That culture is now made up of local factors, tradition, geography, language, economy, but also global factors, mass media, travel, the idea of the global village, and so on. Another factor that determines the shape of any community is the economic <coughs> component. Poverty can deeply and fatally fracture uh, a community. Uh, and perhaps, uh, and this is, I think is an, an axiom nowadays of social planners, perhaps what gives quality to a community is a kind of economic mix. For if poverty fractures a community, then affluence too can disqualify any sense of, can disqualify people from any sense of community, of interacting and relating with one another in a creative way. It can be as destructive of community as is poverty. There's not much of a community, I don't think, in any millionaire's row, is there? And another component of any of these communities is the political one. Sometimes communities need to be held together economically by, by political means, by grants for retraining, by attracting industry, by, by action from provincial or federal or central government. One way or another, it is done by the, by the hand of corporate politics. And this in turn creates assumptions about politics as an instrument of social engineering, which in turn determines the values of, uh, of a community. If I may revert back to Stamford Street, which is part of a ghetto community called um, uh, Barrowfield, the, uh, the assumption that has seeped deeply into the collective soul of that community is that they can only survive if they get a leg up constantly by local government and by central government. Their lives are totally de determined by um, the budgets of the local government or the go budgets of the, of the central government directed towards them. That is the assumption, the political assumption that underlies their life. So there is the community of humankind roughly and briefly described in that way. That is the, the community of humankind. That is where we preach. That is where we serve. That is where some of our churches are set. Now the theological entity to be set against that is the kingdom of God. This bifocal reality that I spoke about at the beginning. This boundary land on which the, the preacher stands. And if uh, community is a slippery concept, so too is the analysis of the idea of the kingdom of God. I think if you read the literature on the subject, is it not rather like trying to hold a balloon full of water? It slips around and it's difficult to get a grip of it. Uh, this kingdom of God, is it, is it from above or is it from below? Is it present or is it future? Is it a location or is it an attitude? Is it within us or among us? And why is it that it is such a central theme in the Gospels and then fades away quickly in favor of the church idea in the Acts of the Apostles, for example, and in the letters of Paul? Now, I suppose that this latter is is an exegetical and hermeneutical issue that's beyond the purview of these lectures. But preachers have to make theological value judgments about what theologians say. We have to do it for the purposes of our exposition and our proclamation of the faith. And preachers are often kind of in the situation of theological midwives between the 
theologians and the people in the pew. And therefore, perhaps we preachers uh, can try to plow our way through this, uh, this jungle and come to a clearing that allows us to relate the community of humankind to the idea of the kingdom of God. Broadly, I think, when you read the, the, the literature, you're faced with uh, two conceptions, with many variations, no doubt, that the kingdom is either from above or it is from below. The above conception takes on board sayings of Jesus that embody uh, the coming of the kingdom in his uh, birth, life, death, and resurrection. The coming of the, of the kingdom in the intersection of history in the incarnation of Jesus Christ. If I by the finger of God cast out demons as Jesus, then is the kingdom among you. And his initial preaching uh, about the kingdom of God being at hand, imminent, inaugurated, <coughs> repent and believe the good news. And this is where people like C.H. Dodd have laid their emphasis when they've spoken about realized eschatology coming of Jesus as an eschatological event in which there is the realization of God's rule upon the earth. And alongside this and completing it as an eschatological act, uh, there is uh, a futuristic dimension in the coming of the Son of Man. There, may, there, there be some standing here who shall not taste of death till they see the coming of the Son of Man. And this is incorporated into the Lord's Prayer, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Right to the end of the, uh, of the canon of Scripture in the book of the Revelation, Maranatha, even so come, Lord Jesus. This is the futuristic dimension to uh, the idea that uh, the kingdom is inaugurated in the great historic event of Jesus Christ, but that there is a, a forward reach to it that comes in the parousia. Now, this kingdom from above theology, I think, works its way through homiletically and expositionally. It does so in the form of a very high Christology that sees the incarnation as the invasion of the kingdom onto our human scene. Christ's death and resurrection as the vindication of God's kingship in Christ. This uh, view of the kingdom from above also sees the conversion of individuals as the making of citizens of this kingdom and the final orientation of it is towards the parousia. Then cometh the end. Now I think that this would be the theological scenario, would it not? Uh, underlying much North American uh, religion, much North American so-called in inverted commas prophetic religion with its futuristic chronology of, uh, of tribulation and, and rapture and millennium and all the variations of it. But it is also the, the scenario, I think, of um, uh, what, if I may say so without being pejorative, is, is much more respectable um, eschatology and uh, uh, understandings of the, of the kingdom um, and has been given expression uh, in, the, in the preaching of some of the greatest, uh, uh, most classic preachers in the Western tradition of preaching. I think of um, someone like Dr. James S. Stewart of Edinburgh, who arguably might be one of, in, in, in the classic tradition of preaching, might arguably be described as the, the finest uh, preacher of the, of the 20th century. Who became a, the James Stewart became a professor uh, of New Testament at uh, New College Edinburgh and Andrew McRae had the inestimable uh, privilege of being his, uh, his student. But Stewart was a great, uh, a great preacher. I used to go and listen to him um, preaching in one of the great West End churches of, uh, of Edinburgh, I suppose in the 50s and 60s perhaps, and uh, uh, Stewart would preach in such a way that the 
uh, the hair on the back of your neck would be standing up when you came out of the when you came out of the church. Wonderful preacher. Well, now I came across a, a book of unpublished, uh, hitherto unpublished sermons uh, that uh, that Stuart uh, preached, and this book was published last year, I believe, on the 100th anniversary of Stuart's birth. Let me quote to you uh, the ending of one of these sermons uh, on the theme, Behold Your God. He says, What is this Christianity I've been speaking of tonight? It's not just loving your neighbor or observing the golden rule or living decently and respectably. It's the message that God has come right down into human life. God has broken through. God has acted. God has come. Did you think Christ might have his day and cease to be? And then this next uh, sentence perhaps uh, uh, reflects the, uh, the setting in which it was preached. Is there a chance that Nazi Germany might root out Christ's religion? Yes, if Christ is just another voice appealing to us to love one another. But no, if he is God in action. Don't be too obsessed, he says, by the human actors in this drama. Get your eyes right off Hitler and Mussolini occasionally. Say unto the cities of Judah, behold your God. God has come. God is here. At any moment he may break through again. That is the world's hope tonight. That is the hope of every contrite heart, the joy of all the meek. Behold the man. Behold the lamb. Behold your king. Behold your God. Let him hear you say it now in the secret of your heart. O oh Jesus, forever I adore thee, my Lord and my God. I can hear Stuart uh, preaching in these, uh, in these uh, trumpet, uh, trumpet tones. But this is the idea of the kingdom that is broken in from above and will yet break in, break in in the future. The kingdom from below concept has as its program the transformation of human community into a form of community where God's rule of love and peace find expression and even acceptance. And this kingdom from below idea was the inspiration underlying the work, for example, of the Christian socialists in Britain uh, under the inspiration of Charles Kingsley, J.M. Ludlow, and Frederick Denison Morris. They preached the gospel of social cooperation they set up a cooperative guild, guilds of tradesmen, as signs of the kingdom. And I think this was also the inspiration underlying the social gospel in North America of people like Walter Rosenbusch, and indeed in Canada, uh, personified in people like Tommy Douglas. And all of this is part of what P.T. Forsyth, the British theologian, called the kingdom of God industry. He meant that the advocates of the view uh, who, who found uh, signs of the kingdom uh, from below, that the advocates of that view were perceiving uh, the reality of God in the mixture of culture and society. There was corn among the tares. There was yeast among the dough. There was treasure that was being uncovered in the, in the stony field of corporate human activity. And these were all signs of the kingdom, signs of the kingdom. I think an exponent of the kingdom from below theology would be L.H. Marshall, who was the, uh, the principal at Rodden College when I was a student there, who wrote a, a book that I think has still great merit to, to it called The Challenge of New Testament Ethics. And Marshall writes in that book, all the ethical teaching of Jesus is simply an exposition of the ethics of the kingdom of God of the way in which men inevitably behave when they actually come under the rule of God. And from this we may conclude that in, in this view, the kingdom is finding expression where the ethics of Jesus, that is the golden rule, the values of the Sermon on the Mount, and the command to love your neighbor, where these are implemented, either in the church or outside of the church, perhaps in secular communities, where these values are preserved and implemented. And all of this starts from inside your heart. Marshall quotes a, quotes a non-canonical saying of Jesus, at least the, the last part of it I think is non-canonical. He says, 
uh, he discovered a saying of Jesus, the kingdom of God is within you, and whoever knows himself will find it. Whoever knows himself will find it. So now, in terms of a homiletical theology of the kingdom in its relation to the community of humankind, which is it to be? Which is it to be? From above, with its uh, watchwords of revelation, vindication, conversion, and triumphal parousia, or from below, looking for signs of a moral kingdom in which no sword is draw drawn and the peaceable fruits of righteousness are to be found upon the face of the earth and in the uh, um, human and communitarian relationships of uh, human beings with one another. Well now what I'm going to suggest to you now is that a credible charismatic theology is always going to rest on the paradox of the above and the below. The longer I live and the longer I uh, minister and preach, the more I think I come to recognize that much Christian truth has to be expressed in paradox. For example, I believe healing is from above and from below. Not all the healing services in the world, I believe, would ever make any one hospital redundant. But, but the prayer of healing is the means by which the power of God does enter human bodies and human souls. It's from above, and it's also from below. So is Scripture. I cannot imagine the Bible without the light shed upon it uh, by the last 100 years or so of biblical scholarship and certainly uh, one's own appreciation of Scripture would be vastly diminished without that kind of illumination. But neither can I think of it, of its authority as being, as being less than the authority of a unique document that bears within it the unique story of the revelation of God's ways with humankind culminating in the witness to Jesus Christ. It's from above and it's from below. And if we press that analogy further and further into the heart of our, our faith, so is Jesus Christ. He is from above and from below. And with all its difficulties, I believe that is the idea preserved, for example, in the story of his virgin birth. He is son of Mary, and yet that holy thing that was conceived in her was of the Holy Ghost. He is the eternal word, but born into the particularity of ge geography and history. Uh, born into what uh, Emil Brunner described in a famous phrase as the uh, scandal of particularity. He is from, ab from above and, and from below. So now I think it not only possible, but I think it essential to speak about the kingdom as an eschatological act of God, but which also finds incarnational and existential expression upon the face of the earth. The kingdom is realized in the, in the absolutely supernatural coming of the word among us in a redemptive and eschatological act. Christ's mighty works were indeed, as, as John points out repeatedly, the signs the signs of that kingdom. And it will find its consummation in the end time, the imagery of which is found in the New Testament. And the trumpet shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall arise, and we who are alive and remain will be caught up to meet with, meet with him in the air. And it doesn't matter a lot to me when you read that, whether you regard it as imagery, poetry, or uh, some uh, futuristic, literal event. One way or another, it is the, uh, the image of the final victory and triumph of the kingdom. This is the kingdom that is from above. 
But to say that is not to nullify the horizontal dimension of the kingdom. Do you remember Jesus' words to the imprisoned John the Baptist? Tell him, tell him what? Tell him that since, since the kingdom has been embodied in my coming amongst men, tell him that, tell him what you are hearing. The blind can see. The lame can walk. The lepers are cleansed. The dead, the deaf hear. And the poor have the, have the gospel, the good news, preached to them. To contextualize it, this is the kingdom taking shape out of the raw material of the human need that confronted Jesus within the particularity of Jerusalem and Judea and Galilee. Now, Christian preaching that encourages agape and righteousness and reconciliation in the context of the human community into which the word is preached is bringing an expression of the kingdom of God. For as Jesus said, the kingdom is like wheat among tares, yeast among dough. It is indeed like the treasure of reconciliation among communities that are fractured Fractured sometimes by affluence. Fractured perhaps more often by <coughs> poverty. And tomorrow, if I may, I would like to look with you a little bit further about the nature of these uh, communities. Thank you very much.